Here we're going to look at an interesting way to define the cosine function. And this comes from my favorite calculus book by Spivak. And what I think is interesting about it, it doesn't use the standard cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse definition. It uses a definition via integrals and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so let's see what parts we need. So for x on the closed interval minus 1 to 1, we'd like to define a evaluated at x to be x times the square root of 1 minus x squared over 2 plus the integral from x to 1 of the square root of 1 minus t squared. So let's notice that this function measures the area of this sector of this half circle. So I've drawn this half circle. So it has equation y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. So in other words, it's the unit circle. If we were to rewrite that, we would have x squared plus y squared equals 1. That means every coordinate on the top half of the circle has the form x comma 1 minus x squared. And now let's notice that this sector can kind of obviously be broken into two parts. This part right here, which is a triangle, and notice the base of the triangle is x, and the height of the triangle is the square root of 1 minus x squared, which makes the area half the product of those two terms. In other words, this term right here. Next, we've got this bit that's to the right of the triangle, and it is represented by this integral. So notice it's the area under the curve, 1 minus t squared, square root of 1 minus t squared, as t goes from x to 1. Now let's look at the following observation. Well, we see that a is a 1 to 1 and on to function from the interval from negative 1 to 1 to 0 to pi over 2. Furthermore, we say, see that a evaluated at negative 1 is pi over 2, and a evaluated at 1 is 0. And that's because if we evaluate at 1, we're not calculating the area of anything. But if we evaluate at negative 1, we calculate the area of half of a circle of radius 1. Half of a circle of radius 1 clearly has area pi over 2. Okay, so now we want to take this and use it to define the cosine function, and here's how we'll do it. So for every x on the interval 0 to pi, we'll define cosine of x to be the unique element of this interval from negative 1 to 1, such that a evaluated at cosine of x equals x over 2. You might think this is a bit of a problem because it only defines cosine of x on the interval from 0 to pi, but we're actually okay here because later we can extend its definition to all real numbers using periodicity. Okay, so let's see what happens if we set x equal to 0. So that means we ha should have a of cosine of 0 should be 0 over 2, which is 0. But looking back over here at our picture and these special values that we calculated, we see that means that cosine of 0 must be equal to 1 because that's the value that creates no area under this curve. Okay, now let's look at the case when x is equal to pi over 2. So that means we should have a evaluated at cosine of pi over 2 equals pi over 4. So now we want to go over here and look for a value of x so that this area of the sector of the circle will be pi over 4. But notice that's just the area of a quarter of a circle, and that occurs when x equals 0. So that means we have cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. Now let's move on to this next one, x is equal to pi. So that means we need a evaluated at cosine of pi is equal to pi over 2. But that's the area of half of a circle. But we know that the area of half of a circle occurs at negative 1. That tells us that cosine of pi must in fact be equal to negative 1. And these numbers should look pretty familiar because they're the standard values of cosine evaluated at these three places. So it looks like, at least for these three places, that the cosine function 
can be defined this way and we will achieve the same function as if we had defined it in terms of right triangles. So the next thing I wanna do is show that the cosine function being defined like this satisfies the same derivative rule that it would have being defined the other way. So now that we've set up and explored this interesting way to define the cosine function, we want to show that it satisfies the same derivative rule that the cosine function should satisfy when defined with the standard method. But before we do that, we also need the sine function. And we'll define the sine function to be the square root of 1 minus cosine squared. And so this is kind of looking ahead towards some identities that we would like this stuff to satisfy in the future. Okay, so now we'll prove the following claim, that the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x is equal to negative sine of x. Again, using this purple boxed definition of cosine, where we have our area function over here. Okay, so how can we prove this? Well, we'll take the derivative of both sides of this equation. So let's look at the derivative with respect to x of a evaluated at cosine of x equals the derivative with respect to x of x over 2. So we need to use the chain rule over here on the left-hand side. So that'll give us a prime evaluated at cosine of x times the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x equals 1 half. So in fact, we want to end up solving for this derivative with respect to x of cosine of x term, which means we need to calculate this a prime evaluated at cosine of x. But let's maybe calculate a prime in general, and that'll make our lives a lot easier. So I'll copy this over, but I'll use a different dummy variable. So I'll call this a of u, and so this will be equal to u times the square root of 1 minus u squared over 2, plus the integral from u to 1 of the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. And now let's look at a prime of u and see what we get. So we need to use the product rule for this first term. So taking the derivative of u, you just get 1. So we'll have the square root of 1 minus u squared over 2. Then we need to take the derivative of the second term. That's going to pick us up a minus sign. So we'll in fact have something that looks like this. So minus u squared over 2 times the square root of 1 minus u squared. So something like that. So here I had to use the chain rule for this square root of 1 minus u squared term, but that's not too complicated. Okay, next we can take the derivative of this last term with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Notice that our variable is in the lower bound of integration, so to use the fundamental theorem of calculus without too much worry, we'll flip the bounds of integration and change this to a minus sign. Then the fundamental theorem of calculus says we just have to stick this right here. So we'll have this as minus the square root of 1 minus u squared. So something like that. Now let's see what we have. We can combine these two terms. Notice here we have half of the square root of 1 minus u squared, and here we're subtracting a whole one. So that's going to leave us with minus the square root of 1 minus u squared over 2, and then minus u squared over 2 times the square root of 1 minus u squared, like that. Now we'll find a common denominator. So the common denominator will be 2 times the square root of 1 minus u squared. So that means we might need to multiply the numerator and the denominator of this first term by that. So multiplying the numerator, we'll just cancel the square root out. We'll have minus 1 plus u squared over 2 times the square root of 1 minus u squared. And here we have minus u squared over 2 times the square root of 1 minus u squared. But now combining those two things, the u squareds will cancel and we'll left, be left with minus half 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared when all is said and done. So now we'll use that calculation where u is substituted with cosine. So that's going to give us minus 1 half and then we'll have 1 over the square root of 1 minus cosine squared x times the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x equals half. So again, what I did here 
is I used my calculation over here to make this substitution right here. Okay. But now we can do a couple of things. Notice that we can take this minus half and this half and cancel the half parts out. And so we'll just be left with, maybe we'll write it as a minus one on this side of the equation when all is said and done. Next, we'll see that this one minus cosine squared under the square root is exactly sine, which means we have one over sine of x times the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x is equal to negative one. But now cross multiplying by sine will give us our goal for this claim. So maybe that's where we're gonna, where we're gonna stop things, but if you wanna continue playing around with this, See if you can use this formula right here, along with what we proved in this claim, to derive the derivative of sine as well. Okay, that's a good place to stop.